Hey, Walter Sorrells back with more tips for the knife maker. Today, the easiest possible way to heat treat a knife. So the single most important and misunderstood aspect of knife making is what's known as heat treating. Uh, it's one of the parts of knife making that's most daunting to guys who are just getting started out with knife making as a hobby. You know, they turn on YouTube and they see complicated furnaces and forges and numerically controlled equipment and so forth that uh, professional smiths are using to heat treat their knives and they just think, well, you know, I can't do that. Well, actually you can. What I'm going to show you today is how you can heat treat a knife blade using only a charcoal fire. Okay, so before we get started, a couple of real quick notes. Um, you know, first point I want to make is this is a real low to the ground method. I mean, both figuratively and literally, as you're going to see. Um, if you want the best heat treating method on earth, this is not going to be it, guys. This is for folks who have, you know, minimal equipment, just getting started, or they want to do something in a really simplistic sort of way. Now, second point, I'm not going to give a whole full lesson here on the theory of heat treating. I'll do that in another video that I'll be doing pretty soon, but I uh, haven't gotten around to that yet. So anyway, this is really just the five cent version of what heat treating is all about. The thing that makes steel such a versatile material is that the hardness and other qualities of the steel can be tuned to optimize for particular applications. You can make steel harder, softer, more brittle, tougher, springier, and so on, and this can all be controlled fairly precisely if you know what you're doing. And the way to get there is by heating and cooling the steel in very specific ways. So, what we'll be doing here is hardening the steel meaning we'll be taking steel in a fairly soft form and converting it into something harder and more suitable for a cutting tool. This process has to be done for every steel knife, so it's a critical skill in knife making. Today, we'll accomplish this by heating the steel up to about 1500 degrees Fahrenheit and then cooling it very rapidly by quenching it in common cooking oil. But the heating will be done with charcoal. Here's what we'll be using. First, I have a knife blade that I've ground to shape in my workshop. It's made from 1084 high carbon steel. This is important. Listen up, guys. The type of steel you use is critical. What we're doing today, you can't do with welding steel from Home Depot. You can't do it with stainless steel. You can't even do it with a simple medium carbon steel like 1050. Not exactly the way we're doing it. To do it the way we're doing it today, you'll need what's known as an oil hardening steel. We'll be using 1084 high carbon steel. 01 is another excellent oil hardening steel that can be used exactly like we're doing it here. You can buy 1084 in small quantities from New Jersey Steel Baron, Admiral Steel, Texas Knife Makers Supply, Jantz Supply, Midwest Knife Making Supply, and plenty of others. So I'm not showing you how to make the blade. I've got plenty of other videos that go into that in a lot of detail. You can find links to some of them by clicking the info button. This is just a simple test blade that won't be made into a fully finished knife. I'll probably just hang it on the wall and use it for shop tasks. Or throw it at somebody I don't like. We'll also be using a hair dryer, a piece of two foot long black iron plumbing pipe, this little magnet on a telescoping stick, blacksmithing tongs, a metal paint can full of peanut oil, and hardwood charcoal. Note, this is not your standard backyard charcoal, it's actual chunks of wood. This type of charcoal used to be hard to find, but is now available in the U.S. at most grocery stores, as well as at many big box stores and home improvement centers. It burns hotter and faster than briquettes. Now, you may be able to get away with using the backyard briquettes, but you'll reach higher temperatures more easily with the hardwood type. All right, let's get started. How's this for fancy heat treating equipment? My son made this little fire ring for himself and his buddies to sit around in the backyard. Continuing on with the fancy rig here, I took my wife's hair dryer, wrapped aluminum ductwork tape around the nozzle to attach it firmly to a piece of one inch ID black iron pipe. 
don't use galvanized pipe. It'll produce zinc fumes, and zinc fumes are poison. Use the black stuff. We want plenty of charcoal so that the blade can be fully immersed in the fire. Bear in mind, this kind of charcoal burns down much quicker than briquettes, so you'll need to err on the side of caution and make a pretty good sized fire. In this case, I ended up using the majority of an 8 pound bag by the time it was over. Another point is, this kind of charcoal doesn't operate quite the same way as briquettes. When you're making hamburgers, you want the whole thing to turn to an even gray embers, but that's not the way you want it to work with hardwood charcoal. So we don't light the fire quite the way we would when we're grilling hamburgers. We don't need the entire thing on fire. Basically what we want is a nice hot spot, and we're going to crank that up by blowing air into the fire using the hair dryer. Oxygen, as we all know from high school chemistry, is the engine behind fire. The more oxygen, the hotter the fire. So we're basically going to just sort of drive that hot spot through the charcoal, adding fresh charcoal as the fire burns down. Want to do this without electricity? Just go old school using a helper and common fireplace bellows. Oxygen's oxygen. However you do it though, you're going to have to have something blowing a lot of air in there. You can't just let it burn like you would when you're making hamburgers. So once the fire is really burning, I'll put the blade into the fire. Easy does it. You'll overheat the blade if you're not careful, and that can have very negative metallurgical consequences for your blade. Believe it or not, you can nearly melt steel in a charcoal fire. As we've alluded, there's a hot spot where the air enters the fire. You're going to put your blade in there so the tip is just hanging out the far side of that hot spot. The thinner the steel, the faster it heats, so of course the tip is going to overheat most easily and the edge just behind that. So try to build your heat up from the tang and let it flow forward. Now this is easier said than done, but just keep screwing around with it. That's a technical term in bladesmithing, by the way, that means move everything around. You'll need to fuss with the fire. You'll need to kind of move the charcoal, heap it over the blade, maybe add a little more fresh charcoal as you go. Just keep that hot spot there and keep working your blade to let it accumulate heat. Now because I'm filming, I'm doing this during daylight hours, but actually I recommend doing it at night. The color of the steel allows you to determine very roughly how hot it is. Watch as I'm forging here. As the steel cools, of course it darkens up, and that gives me a sense of what the temperature of the steel is. Now bear in mind, using color is not a perfect system. You can find charts in old blacksmithing books that say such and such colors 1400 degrees and such and such colors 1550 and so on. They have nice names for it, dull red, cherry red, bright orange, lemon yellow, blah blah blah. But your perception of the colors in the steel is entirely dependent on what kind of ambient light you're dealing with. Something that looks cherry red at night appears almost black in full-on Georgia summer sunshine. What you can do though, even during the day, is to see the relative evenness of the heat. The same color across the blade equals the same temperature across the blade. You can see in this forging footage how certain parts are cooling down faster than others. Same works in reverse as you're heating it up. When you see that certain parts are darker than others, you want to sort of focus those in front of the heat. You'll notice that I'm touching the blade periodically with my little telescoping magnet. When steel reaches a temperature of about 1425 Fahrenheit, or around 750 Celsius, it begins to lose its magnetic qualities. So, regardless of the color, if your magnet ceases to be attracted to the steel, you know you've hit 1425. Now we're actually aiming a hair higher, about 75 degrees higher. Will we hit this number perfectly? No, not using this method. But look, we can get close enough. So once the blade goes non-magnetic, I know I just need to heat it a tiny bit more. As I said, I'm aiming for about 1500 Fahrenheit here. So I'll just run it through the charcoal for 10 to 20 more seconds. Then, in one quick motion, I jam it into the oil. Be careful, because it'll flame up on you. There's no need to freak out about this. If it does, just be prepared for it. I'll agitate it a little to get the heat dispersed as quickly as possible. Then I'll immerse the entire thing, including the tang, in the oil.
Once it's cool enough to touch, I'll remove the blade and test to make sure it's hardened. I'll do that by rubbing the corner of a file against the steel. If the file bites into the steel, then the blade didn't harden. On the other hand, if it skates over the surface like it does here, then everything's gone right and now you have hardened steel. At this point, your blade's very hard. Too hard to actually use as a knife. Why too hard? Because it'll snap if any serious pressure is put on it. So, what you need to do next is what's called tempering the steel, meaning that you need to heat it a second time to a much lower temperature, which will soften the steel and make it less susceptible to snapping. Normally, I would just put the blade into a heat treating oven or a temperature controlled liquid bath that I can keep at a very controlled temperature. If you want, though, you can throw it in your oven for an hour at 450 degrees and it'll come out fine. But I'm going to show you the old school approach, the way Smiths did it back in the day. First, I'm going to quickly grind the black scale off this blade. So now I've got a nice clean surface. Before I show you what I'm going to do with this knife, I'm going to stick this little bar of steel in the fire. Watch as right in front of your eyes, colors begin to form on the steel. Unlike the colors up in the 1500 range, which are radiated from the steel, these colors are on the surface. They're caused by oxides forming on the steel. Now, if you watch them move across the steel, you'll see that they come in a range of colors. And this range of colors corresponds very roughly to the temperature of the steel. Silvery grays around, oh, 700 to 800 Fahrenheit, blue and purple around 600, brown around 500, and this yellowish color, which is traditionally referred to as straw colored, that's around 400 or just a little bit below. So what the old smiths used to do was heat the blade just enough to bring some of that color onto it. Now you want to make sure that you keep the spine toward the fire because it heats faster. Just as we talked about before, the thin parts are going to heat faster, the blade and the point. So keep those as far away from the fire as possible. Try to heat that tang first and let the heat propagate up through the blade to the skinny parts. Now I've let the fire burn down and I'm using the embers which are still extremely hot. Don't rush this. Ideally you want the spine to start showing color first and let that color move through the thinner parts. But depending on your fire, the blade itself may heat first. If that happens, just cool the edge and tip very quickly in a bucket of water. In a perfect world, you'd like the spine to be blue so it's nice and soft and springy, and the blade to be straw colored. But you really can't do that in a situation like this. You need a much more isolated heat source like a torch to do that. So just keep moving it around watching that color. If you just jam the blade in there and let it heat up naturally, you'll overheat the edge and underheat the spine. So here's where we landed. It worked out okay, but not great. It looks browner in the pictures than it looks in real life. But the bottom line is it's still plenty hard for a knife. Whether you're a new knife maker without much gear or you just want to do things using historical methods, now you've got an approach that will allow you to harden and temper a knife just the way they did it 150 years ago or 500 years ago. Well, they didn't have hair dryers. But hey, if you're doing this because you're a Civil War reenactor and you want to be completely historically accurate, you're going to run out and buy a set of bellows. Me, hair dryer's fine. So if you followed along but you're making a slightly less primitive blade than this, you're ready to put the handle on. If you've reached that point and want to see what's next, check out this video where I show how to put a handle on a knife blade. Okay, so I know I've said it before, but I'll make this point again. This is not the most optimal way of making a knife. Uh, you know, is this how I do it in my shop? Absolutely not. But that doesn't mean that it won't work for you. And if you're just getting started, this is a really cool and pretty effective way of making a great little knife. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you liked it, here are a couple of other videos that you might be interested in. Also, like me on Facebook at Walter Sorrels Blades and check out my website, waltersorrelsblades.com, where you'll find examples of my work along with instructional videos showing all aspects of Japanese sword making, including forging and polishing, how to make hamones, and how to make fittings, scabbards, and handles for Japanese swords.